So there are parts of the story that Doug read that really don't make sense um, outside of some, some more context to it. So let me just tell you a little more. It was actually the first story Luke told in his gospel. After explaining why he wrote it, Luke said, during the reign of King Herod, which is kind of a, once upon a time, there was a priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. She was descended from the daughters of Aaron, part of the priestly class too. Now you think about it, with two parents like that, both descended from priests, long lines. Can you imagine the pressure on John to become a priest as well? I mean, in, in many ways, John was a, a typical PK, a, a preacher's kid. Because instead of going into a, a more traditionally respectable form of the family business, John was like one of those wild-eyed preachers on street corners yelling at people to repent a kind of rebellious 1960s love child with wild hair wearing a cloak made of rough camel hair and his diet was a simple diet of locusts and honey. But I've gotten way ahead of myself. So here's how the story begins. One day Zechariah was inside the sanctuary of the temple. It's the, the holiest of holy places where only priests could enter. Now, when we hear the word sanctuary, we can imagine a room like this, but this room, this sanctuary, was so holy, only a priest could enter. And it was thought that if a, a priest entered and wasn't pure enough, he could be struck dead. In fact, there's a, a legend uh, about uh, that on Yom Kippur, they tied a rope around the ankle of the assigned priest and a, a rope around his waist, so that if he was struck dead by his impurity in the face of the holiness of God, then those outside the sanctuary would hear the bell ring when he dropped dead. And then use the rope to pull the body out because nobody else would want to go in. Now that might be true, it might not. But anyway, as Luke tells the story, when Zechariah was in the sanctuary to carry out his duties, an angel appeared next to the incense table. Zechariah was terrified. No one else was allowed in there. But the angel, named Gabriel, said, do not fear, and then proceeded to tell him that Elizabeth would bear a child to be named John. Zechariah replied, do you expect me to believe this? I'm an old man and my wife is an old woman. And because Zechariah didn't believe, he became mute. Has echoes of Abraham and Sarah who laughed at the idea she could become pregnant at age 90. Well, Zechariah emerged from the sanctuary and people could clearly tell something had happened to him, that he had had a vision, not to mention he couldn't speak. And I might add, it doesn't say anywhere in the story whether anyone bothered to tell Elizabeth. But sure enough, she conceived shortly after and went off by herself, by herself, for five months. And I'd love to know why. I'd love to know what was going through her mind. But then in the sixth month of her pregnancy, the same angel, Gabriel, visited a young girl in Nazareth named Mary and told her that she would improbably become pregnant too. And you've heard that part of the story many, many, many times times. So Mary went to stay with her cousin Elizabeth for three months. And as Mary approached Elizabeth, the baby in Elizabeth's womb jumped for joy. Elizabeth said to Mary, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And Mary responded with the words we call the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior because God has looked with favor upon the lowliness of his servant. And then came time for Elizabeth to give birth. And that's where our story began today. Eight days after the birth, it was time to name the baby. But instead of calling him Zechariah, she told them to name him John. And the neighbors looked at each other, what kind of funny business is this? 
There's no John in Zechariah's family history. So they went to Zechariah and asked him, and because he couldn't speak, he wrote on a tablet the name John. And suddenly he could speak, and everyone was amazed, a little frightened, but amazed. Who is this child? And then like the songs that Mary and Elizabeth sang to one another, Zechariah broke into song, which ends with these beautiful words. By the tender mercy of our God, a dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in the night and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The story ends, the child grew and became strong in spirit. This story provides the foundation upon which the rest of the story of Jesus is built. So at our lunch and lectionary on Thursday, I asked the architect in our group, Al Mazur, about the importance of foundations. And he said, of course, that without a proper foundation, the whole thing will collapse. And it made me think, Zechariah and Elizabeth provided the foundation for John. Who laid the foundation for our practice of faith? For me, the witness of my parents played a huge role. So on Friday, I asked that question during my daily connection. On Facebook, I asked, who provided the foundation for your faith and how? The responses were immediate and overwhelming, more than 50 long and thoughtful posts. And lots of similarities, especially parents, but in some cases, for example, it was a neighbor who brought them to church, or grandparents, aunts and uncles, or just walking in on your own initiative. One of my dearest friends from my days in Washington, D.C. said, while my parents and grandparents were influential in getting me to church, it was the myriad of adults I encountered there that nurtured and tended my growth. Sunday school teachers, youth directors, camp counselors, choir directors, retreat leaders, and especially folks in the pews. But in particular, the director of Christian education at my home church opened so much up for me. She laid the groundwork for my faith practice to this day. Through her, I learned that creation and creativity, laughter and joy are integral to seeking justice. One of my cousins from my home church agreed. He said his parents brought him to church but once my parents got me there, if there had been nothing, I would not have had a strong foundation. It was all those other adults who took over, adding that my mother was one of them. But his example pointed to this. While his parents may have brought him to church, it was all the people of the church that brought him to faith. And that is such an important Inside, His parents brought him to church. But it was all the people of the church that brought him to faith. And faith, after all, is the point, not the church. Which makes me wonder, do we realize what Im an impression we have on the youth and children of our congregation? And more significantly, is this, is this a role we embrace? The Im most impactful change we can bring upon the world is by shaping and forming the faith lives of children, introducing them and practicing the love of God, compassion of Jesus, and justice of the prophets. I want to raise again an expanded vision of ministry with children, youth, and families at church, at home, and for our community. We're just about finished writing a job description and still welcome your input and hope to advertise soon for the position of director of ministry with children and families, in addition to our director of youth ministry. But if we expect this to be the duty of one part-time employee, then our foundation would be so small it could tip over almost immediately. Who is supporting this person? But 
more importantly, what system do we currently have in place to lift up and hold this ministry together? We don't really have one focused on children. And even if we did just one ministry, it would be a pretty narrow foundation too. How, I ask, can all of our ministry groups ask questions of themselves about supporting children, youth, and families? The faith formation ministry has one role among many other responsibilities for adults. But in addition, for example, what specifically can the fellowship ministry do? With, for example, events that bring generations together. How is our worship service designed with children and youth and families in mind? What can personnel, property, membership, the diaconate, or mission and outreach do? In fact, mission and outreach just gave the youth group $1,000 to support a project they wanted to do for just in time for foster youth. It's a great collaboration, and the youth felt supported. Friday night, they made Christmas ornaments that people can buy after church for a donation for the youth group to give to Sa San Diego 350, which is an environmental group who came and spoke to the youth on Friday. I encourage these questions of every ministry. What are we doing within our area of responsibility to lift up children, youth, and families? But remember, of course, that the definition of families and the vision of our church is much broader and more inclusive than we might think of. Talking about single families, LGBTQ families, grandparents, foster families, families of choice when families of origins utter, utterly fail us. And I use the example of my own household. An uncle raising his nephew as his own child along with his male husband of a different race. Focus on the family would say, our family is going to hell. <laughs> and these are exactly the kinds of families especially welcomed here. I also invite our church council to think of children, youth, and families as an ongoing priority at our meetings. What is the impact of one decision or another? And this in no way diminishes the importance of other groups or people who are older. In fact, I think it honors the legacy of decades of faithful service and financial generosity. Certainly more than anyone, a church elder wants a vibrant congregation for the next generation, but in this church, our hope is not just for a vibrant congregation. We seek a world that is more open, inclusive, just, and compassionate than the one we have today. We want this world better. Who's going to help us make it? And again, faith is the larger point, not the church. Whoever may bring someone with them to church, whether it's an adult or a child, are the people of the church ready to bring them to a faith that might actually change the world? Who did that for you? And who is looking to you? It is finally said of the child John, he grew and became strong in spirit. May the children of our church and of our community also grow and become strong in spirit because of the witness of your faith. Amen.